the World Cup is back, and that means I get to channel four years of ambivalence towards soccer, football, whatever, into one month of excitement. In honor of the U.S. team's incredible victory earlier this week, let's talk about another international battle that happened 202 years ago. It's the War World Cup of 1812. See what I did there? Disclaimer, before we go any further, I must acknowledge that my working knowledge of soccer, football, whatever, my working knowledge is limited to the Rodney Dangerfield flick, Ladybugs. Let's take a look at the original group of death, England, France, Spain, and the United States of America. Now for the purpose of this exercise, we're gonna say that the US had already knocked out Spain, although it would not be made official until the adams onis Treaty of 1819, which got us Florida. But Spain really wasn't set up to win anyway. The Napoleonic Wars had taken a huge toll on them. Speaking of Napoleon, in an earlier round, France, captained by Napoleon, hard to get cold on a handball when you always got your hand in your shirt, well, they went up against England. Well, actually, it was France versus England, Spain, Portugal, Russia, Russia's winter, the Ottoman Empire, the Papal States, really, the Pope? After horrible playing conditions, and over seven overtimes, England and its seven coalition line got the victory at Waterloo Stadium. So we'll say that leaves us with England versus US. And once again, the US were not the favorites. Now the Americans had already lost their number of valuable players to the English vulturing, or in technical terms, impressing some of their merchant sailors. Basically, England said, you're gonna be playing for us now. Yeah, that's my, that, that's my English accent. Okay. This led Team U.S. to pass the Embargo Act of 1807, which was meant to punish England for stealing American players, but really just hamstrung the U.S. since England was a major importer of American goods. Before the match, management in the U.S. was divided. Warhawks like Henry Clay said that we should go on the offensive early and often. Doves like the Federalist Party wanted to hold back, possibly even to see if the match would be called on account of weather. But then the British really tried to get into the American kitchen by encouraging Indian raids out west. On June 18, 1812, after American team captain James Madison sent a list of grievances to his congressional players, the match began. This was the first time that the young American team had ever blown the whistle, i.e. declared war on another nation. Never mind the fact that England was trying to delay the game since their previous prime minister had just been assassinated. Let's go! England, dealing with fanatical French fans overseas, went on the defensive and played the minimum seven players. Team America drove deep into English territory but went way out of bounds into Canada. Awesome work by English Major General Brock and Shawnee leader Tecumseh so the English gained possession and start marching down the pitch. Even if Brock eventually had to be carried out on a stretcher, the Americans then made some headway in the Great Lakes that had accumulated in the middle of the pitch and finisher Oliver Hazard Perry put it in the corner of the net! We have met the enemy, and he is gone! At the start of the second half, the English brought out the tried and true blockade formation, cutting off American agricultural exports. And with the Napoleonic War winding down, England put in all its substitutions. Just before full time, England drove the ball deep into the Chesapeake Bay and scored an equalizer by burning down the White House! Whoa! But the Americans responded with what would become their trademark fight song. Oh, say can you see? During stoppage time, American General Andrew Jackson thought he had scored the game-winning goal at the Battle of New Orleans, but it was ruled no good because the war was over. The battle had taken place on January 8th, while the war had ended with the Treaty of Ghent, which was signed on Christmas Eve of the previous year. So the match appeared to be a draw, with neither side gaining any more of the pitch than it had started with. But the Americans had proven themselves a worthy opponent, and in over, over, over time, James Monroe scored a hand of God shot in the form of the Monroe Doctrine, stating that the Western Hemisphere group at least would now be controlled by America. Goal! That's all for now. Hopefully this video doesn't turn out to be a giant jinx for the American team. Why aren't you following me on Twitter at Mr. Betts Class or liking me on Facebook? Links down below. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe and check back every Thursday for a new video. Be safe and I'll see you next time.